Hello everybody and welcome back. One of the first people to listen to my account and share it was a gentleman named Michael Bachman and he runs a blog called Cryptozoology News and it's a blog I check in with on a weekly basis and I ever catch up on all of his reports. Now this report happened 25 years before mine and was thousands of miles away and for all there are many differences some of the sentences the lady uses and some of her comments could be my own. And many of the UK witnesses will find they too have probably spoken the same words. No matter where you are in the world or how old you are, the experience never leaves you, no matter how many years pass by. A woman in Ohio claims that a group of Bigfoots recurrently visited her and her family starting in 1962, keeping her captive in a cave at the age of 12. The 55-year-old lady provided a full name, but asked to remain anonymous and to not reveal the isolated location where the incidents occurred. I prefer not to say where this took place, specifically. No one wants an invasion of Bigfoot hunters on your private land. Let people go to the public lands of the Wayne National Forest to look for Bigfoot. People down in the hills love living where they live because it's quiet and there's fresh air, clean water, and great conditions for raising gardens and children. And being in the thick of nature to see the wild animals up close is something they all value very much. I'd rather that people work harder on gathering the mountain of eyewitness reports and experiences that's been hidden in the past decades in this state than to see them destroying nature, she told Cryptozoology News. She also says she works in the service industry for the past decade and that she was very active in volunteer work at the schools in the area. Reportedly, she wasn't the only one experiencing these encounters. These creatures were witnessed in part by my parents, she said. People do need to know that these things happened to me. It still pains me greatly, but at least I can talk about it now in some part, though without anyone knowing who I am. People are absolutely cruel, she explained. She also said that the incidents happened too many times to keep count of them and that some of the neighbours had similar experiences, including some young boys fishing by the river. These events were allegedly reported to the police. One time, she says, the huge one came back to take her and Dad shot at it with a 12-gauge shotgun. The big one that always came to take me out of the bedroom at night, came, but this time he came during the daytime. Dad was about 15 feet from it, and the shot from the gun was hitting this thing, and every time it hit it, he'd stomp really hard on the ground with one foot after the other. My brother and I ran up to my bedroom because the youngest said it was higher ground for a better defence, and there were more creatures over in the farmer's drainage ditch across the road. They were huge too. I mean, what do you do as a kid of, say, 14, and you see something like that? Good thing my three brothers were with me to help protect me. I yelled to the creatures to leave or they would be hurt. They finally left, and there uh, was a lot of day left that day, though we were not allowed to go out. My brothers wanted to go and check on the neighbours to see if they were OK or they needed help. The ditch where the beasts were purportedly hiding was across the road from the neighbour's front picture window. I can only imagine their horror at seeing what they were seeing, wondering if they were going to die too. Sure enough, they looked pretty shell-shocked by the time we found them, she adds. According to the witness, most of the neighbour's children were hiding in the closet while the parents were out in the living room keeping an eye on that ditch. She claims the animals were of different sizes, male and female, but that the biggest one was a 14-foot tall male with the head the size of a regulation basketball. His hair was long and about the same texture as mine, as I recall, she said. The hair on all of them was about the same shade of brown, like the colour of decomposed wood and leaves that you find in the forest. I could see skin around his eyes that was tanned looking, and there was a facial hair and it was more sparse with glimpses of skin showing through that area as well. I couldn't make out a neck, and his chin was broad, and his teeth were about the size of the nail on my middle finger, but they were flat, and he had a mouthful of them, meaning the width of his bite was wide. His mouth was wide enough to show most of his teeth. 
His eyes were dark, with some white around them, less so than human eyes. They were kind and had crow's feet on the outer edge of them. His skin was weathered like anyone who spent much time outside, like a farmer. His shoulders were very broad, though. I did see his collarbone on one side, which looked thick compared to a human's. He was muscular and heavily built, but in no way fat. Now, there was an adult female and others who were almost as big as the female, but they didn't seem to be young or old. I don't know if they were all related, but they seemed like a close-knit group. So there was an adult male and a female who seemed to be a couple, and two others that seemed to have maturity and body mass, suggestive that they were what we'd consider about 40-something in humans. Other than that, I couldn't tell you what age they were. Then the horrific kidnappings had began. Many of my memories of these creatures were so traumatic that my mind hid them from me. I've no idea what else I've experienced with them in my childhood. Well, not yet. You see, the memories are still popping up to the surface. And I've got to tell you, it's not a pleasant thing to know you've been taken innumerable times by these creatures across many hills far from your home. I've no idea what transpired while I was with them. But each time they took me, I was out all night long, she explains. Due to the stress, the young girl tried to sleep during the day, but her mother wasn't happy about that. I was being used in a tug of war, and neither side was winning. Certain people at nearby churches were told what was going on, and they'd take me aside and anoint me with oil and lay hands on me, pray- praying out loud, and all I wanted to do was lie down and go to sleep from that circus. I was confined to the house for weeks, not being allowed to look out of any windows. Sometimes, she says, things were peaceful, but occasionally the creatures became violent. I was probably around 12 when I woke up in an underground cave that was dripping water from the roots I could see stretching below the ground. You can't imagine the horror that I felt. I was screaming my lungs out, and after a while I ran out of force to make any sounds, but the air just kept coming out of me. I could see these creatures surrounding me as I lay there and able to move on this great slab of rock. I wanted badly to scream some more, but I was just too tired to do that anymore. When I relaxed, they were all startled, smiling and laughing. I thought, OK, they could have killed me and eaten me, but they didn't. Eventually, some of them are kind, but then again, I've seen cats play with mice for hours before they kill and eat them. Could this have been a product of her imagination, Michael asks? A nightmare, perhaps? But she said no, and steadfastly no. She remembers everything clearly, and so does her family. They were clearly not childhood nightmares, as evidenced by the incident that took place around the time I was 12 when my dad shot at it. The big hairy male was in the field across the road from our house, about 15, 20 feet in, and Dad was standing in our front yard shooting at him. What got my notice was this pounding like a pile driver used for drilling, but there was no metal sound. I kept hearing this really long, loud yelling too, and finally got to where I couldn't concentrate on my book, so I yelled to anyone who was downstairs, what the hell was all that racket? I asked who the heck we knew that could hold a screen for that long. I recognised the shooting and asked who was shooting too. Mum asked me questions each time. He, the Bigfoot, came back to my window and took me with him. He took me with him many, many times. And after talking to me to get me to tell the big guy not to take me with him and that they told me to tell him no, I wasn't going and that seemingly not to work, she pretty much much gave up asking me anything. She did talk to Dad about how to stop this from happening though, that she thought it was affecting my health and robbing us all of our sleep. There was concern that if they did the wrong thing, this creature could kill everyone in the house. Mum offered and wept to my older sisters about this big hairy thing that got into the chicken coop and how she needed their help to convince Dad to do something to stop this before someone got hurt. She told them not to go near me and told me not to go near them. She was quite fearful and in retrospect I can't blame her. But Dad for his part over the years at times would ask me if I thought my big hairy friend was around anywhere. Then the family decided to move her bed downstairs, but this appeared to infuriate the beast even more. 
I remember hearing him from downstairs and he'd be up there pecking at my window, but I was strictly forbidden from leaving the area for any reason. He would bang on the side of the house and Dad would yell at him to go away, that he wasn't going to see me anymore and that was that. He made these loud grunts and stomping on the ground to show his displeasure. I'd hear his thoughts in my head as he was asking where I was, she said. Another time, according to the witness, she and her father were driving near the woods when they heard a strange scream. I was 19 and we were on the front stoop talking before I left when there was this very long, loud, deep scream like a man was getting murdered up the road in the woods. Sound did carry, especially on cold nights, but this had an excessive volume to it and no human could have ever held a full-on scream that long. I thought someone was being hurt up there and I refused to call the sheriff's... Uh, but Dad refused to call the sheriff's office to report it. I thought my dad had lost it. But she says she called the authorities as soon as she got home to her own house. The things they said really made me wonder if they were scared to go into the woods. Well, why are the deputies if they're scared to go in the woods, she said. I asked if they couldn't look for vehicle tracks and boot prints up that lane to the gate and they finally said they'd go down there the next day to check. They appreciated that I described the place and it helped them feel more at ease and they just kept saying that the station policy was not to go into the woods at night for any reason. The animals also appeared to be able to communicate by using vocal sounds and telepathy. The sounds they made were like a deep bass lapping, chortling and snickering. Sounds like someone who couldn't pronounce words well. They communicated this way with each other and with their thoughts just as the male did with me. I had no interaction from the younger ones, and the female adult only smiled or sighed heavily while looking at me. She talked with the younger ones and the big male about me, I knew that. She looked sad, and they used their hands to motion, much like when we play charades. Now the neighbours and the other kids at school, she reveals, also spoke of strange occurrences, and the dangers of being stigmatised for telling their stories. We weren't talking about our experiences with them, but we were listening to what others were having to deal with at their places with the same creatures that each person who experienced them gave different names to. They were never called Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but they were called monsters, creatures, monkey men, giants, etc. We listened to what the other neighbours would tell us about them because they thought no one was likely to believe kids that heard it and passed it on. The neighbours next door never spoke about their experience after the day that it happened. The others weren't at home when it took place, except the old lady living on the farm up next to the hill across the valley, but she didn't let slip with that until later. We didn't see her that often, so those who had experiences were being judged and laughed at by some who did not see them or have to put up with their behaviour. The woman says that she decided to tell her story, because she feels that it would help others to come forward too. So many times I've read authors saying they wish they knew. They wish those who knew would share what they know with the world. Well, that's why I've shared this. Talking about these things has not been easy. And for the most part, the trauma associated with these things did cause what's called traumatic childhood amnesia. I hope it brings awareness to the suffering of experiences and witnesses and allows them to speak openly about what has happened to them. Unless we all speak the truth, the world won't know what's been hidden, and still being hidden from us. Do we want future generations to carry on living the same life? Our world is richer and more interesting than most people could ever imagine. These are not just creatures. They're quite intelligent and resourceful enough to keep from being caught or killed. Until next time, good night.